Welcome to Grace Bible Study. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 17? Genesis chapter 17. Now, over the last uh, volume one and volume two, we talked a little bit about salvation. We talked a little bit about uh, the new covenant. We talked a little bit about the basics of rightly dividing and the fall of Israel. We're going to be getting into a little bit more detail uh, today, and I want you to go to Genesis 17, and we'll get started right there. Now, uh, this is very important. You need to know about the covenant of circumcision which was given to Abraham because this makes a big difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Now, uh, Genesis chapter 17, I want you to notice in verse 1, the Bible says, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shalt thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be, called, shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Okay, let's stop right here for just a moment. Now, verse 7, I want you to understand very plain and very clear. Now watch, verse 7 again. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Okay? So what we have here is we have, the Lord says he's going to keep have a covenant that he's going to make with Abraham and his seed, his descendants, and for the, in their generations after them. And it's going to be an everlasting covenant. All right? Let's go on. It says, To be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. Now, this is very important, okay? God says, Abram, I'm going to be a God unto you and to thy seed after thee. All right, now this was uh, the covenant that God was going to make with Abraham. Now watch. Uh, let's go on to verse 8. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep, between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. So what we have here is the token of the covenant between God and Abraham is the circumcision of the flesh. Please notice this is not a spiritual circumcision. This is a circumcision of the flesh that is the token of the covenant. Now the covenant is, let's go back to verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, uh, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Now the covenant is God will be a God unto them. In other words, he's going to take care of them, watch over them, uh, multiply his seed. He's going to be a God unto them and watch over them. And uh, Abraham and his seed are going to be the Lord's people. All right, let's go back up uh, to verse 12. It says, and he said, uh, excuse me, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. Now watch verse 13. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. Notice the word must there. He says must. He said that means you have to. You have to be circumcised in the flesh. And it says, And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Now question, how long is everlasting? Oh, well, it, it, it doesn't ever stop, okay? This is an everlasting covenant that God has made with Abraham, all right? And the token of that covenant is the uh, circumcision of the flesh. Now watch verse 14. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, 
That soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Okay, so what we have here is God makes a covenant with Abraham. He says, I will be a God unto you, but here's the thing that you have to do. This is the token of the covenant. He says, every male uh, has to be circumcised in the flesh. Okay, verse 14 again. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So in other words, if you wasn't circumcised, all right, in the flesh, then you have broken covenant with God and you cannot be partaker with God's people. One more time, this is very, very important. Verse 14. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Now, this is very, very, very important. Now, we're living during a dispensation of grace, okay? Now, during a dispensation of grace, you don't need to be circumcised to be saved or anything like that. But uh, what we have here is back in the Old Testament scriptures, circumcision was a big thing. And uh, during the dispensation of grace, it's not. But people need to understand about the covenant of circumcision, it is very, very, very important. Now let's go on to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Now what we've learned so far is that if a man doesn't keep uh, the covenant of circumcision, he cannot be partaker with God's people. And God's people is the nation of Israel. All right. In fact, I tell you what, uh, let's go to chapter, uh, Exodus chapter, um, chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Notice in verse 10, it says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh. Now he's talking to Moses. He says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So what we have here is uh, the Lord's people is the children of Israel. Now, in Genesis chapter 17, we talked about Abraham. All right, Abraham... Uh, had a, a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and Israel had 12 uh, sons, and these are the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, so these children of Israel, they are God's people. All right, notice in Exodus chapter 12, I want you to go, um, let's go, we'll start in verse 43. Exodus chapter 12, verse 43. All right, and it says, and the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. A foreign, uh, excuse me, in one house shall it be eaten, and thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. So what we have here is we have the ordinance of the Passover. The Lord's telling Moses and Aaron, he says this is the ordinance of the Passover, okay? And he tells them what to do, but he tells them an uncircumcised person cannot be partaker of the Passover. He says, no way. In verse 48, he says, And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Okay, so what they had to do, if they wanted to keep the Passover, they had to be circumcised first, and then they could keep the Passover. Notice in verse uh, 48, we're going to finish up. It says, And then let them come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So what we have so far, we've got, um, we've got uh, no uncircumcised person can be partaker with the nation of Israel. And then we have no uncircumcised person can be partaker of the Passover. Now, if you know your scripture, you know that the Passover represents Christ. Jesus Christ was the Passover lamb. He died on the 14th day of the first month uh, when he died and paid for our sins, and he was the Passover lamb. All right, but let's go to uh, Ezekiel. I want you to go to Ezekiel. Oops, not far enough here. All right, Ezekiel chapter 44. 
Ezekiel chapter 44. Now in Ezekiel chapter 44, uh, the Lord was having a problem with some of the children of Israel. They were letting uncircumcised people go into the temple. Now watch. Ezekiel chapter 44, I want you to notice in verse 6. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 6, it says, and thou shalt say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations, in that ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary to pollute it. Even my house, when you offer my bread and the fat and the blood, and they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations." And ye have not kept the charge of mine holy things, but ye have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. Now watch verse 9. Thus saith the Lord God, no, uh, no stranger, uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in flesh, shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. Okay? So what we have here, we have a scripture telling us that an uncircumcised person could not go up into the temple. They couldn't go into the temple and offer sacrifice for their sins like the nation of Israel. Okay? Uh, so what we have here is the uncircumcised were separated from the circumcised. This is the division that God made. Okay? Uh, we have the, uh, the circumcision, which are the Jews, and we have the uncircumcision, which are the Gentiles. Okay? And there's a separation here, and God says so far what we have, we have that an uncircumcised person cannot be partaker with the nation of Israel. An uncircumcised person cannot be partaker of the Passover, which you know represents Christ. An uncircumcised person cannot go into the temple to offer up sacrifice for his sins, okay? So what we have here is an uncircumcised man had a problem. He did not have God in his life, okay? The Bible says uh, in Genesis chapter 17, he said, Abraham, I'm going to make a covenant with you, and I'll be a God unto you, and to thy seed after you, all right? And the token of that is the circumcision of the flesh. All right, so let's go on. Now, I want you to go to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46, I want you to notice in verse 12. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 12. Now, it says in verse 12, Hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted, that are far from righteousness, I bring near my righteousness, it shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. So what we have here is we have scriptures telling us that the Lord is going to give salvation. He's going to place salvation in Zion, but it's going to be for Israel. Does he say it's going to be for the whole world? No, he doesn't. He says it's going to be for Israel. Now, why do you think the Lord said this? He said it because he meant it, all right? Salvation was for Israel. Now watch. I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Now, we're going to start in verse 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. All right, so what we have here, we have the Lord telling them that he's going to make a new covenant with them. Now, we've already discussed the covenant of circumcision given to Abraham. When Moses came on the scene, he gave them the covenant of the law. Now, what he's doing here in verse, verse 31 and 32, he's comparing the new covenant with the old covenant, which was the covenant of the law when they came out of Egypt. Now, watch verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, I want you to understand this is very, very important. 
okay? This new covenant has to do with Israel getting their sins forgiven. Now, I want you to notice in verse 31 again. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, who's he going to make this covenant with? He's going to make it with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. These are the Jews. These are the 12 tribes we talked about uh, in volume 2, all right, about uh, uh, they had the 10 tribes and, and the 2 tribes, which makes 12 tribes. They're all Jews. These are the children of Israel, okay? The Lord says he's going to make a new covenant with the nation of Israel. Now, let's read it again. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, do you see any covenant made with the uncircumcised Gentiles here. No, there is no new covenant made with the uncircumcised Gentiles. God's not dealing with no uncircumcised Gentiles here. He's made promises to the nation of Israel. He says, I'll be a God unto you and to thy seed after thee. And he says in Isaiah, I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. So what we have here is scripture that God's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And it has to do with the forgiveness of their sins. Notice in verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So what we have here is, the new covenant is God's going to forgive Israel's sin, okay? And he's going to do it with Israel, not the uncircumcised Gentiles. Now i got a question for you. Can an uncircumcised man uh, that could not be partaker with the nation of Israel, he could not uh, be partaker of the Passover, he could not go into the temple, offer up sacrifice for his sins, could this uncircumcised man be partaker of a new covenant that wasn't made for him to start off with? No way, people. He was not partaker of the new covenant. God says he's going to make this for Israel. Now, as we go into the New Testament scriptures, I want to show you that Jesus Christ is not dealing with the uncircumcised Gentiles in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, first of all, I want you to go to Malachi. Go to Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, I want you to notice in verse 1, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now this messenger is John the Baptist, okay? The Lord refers to him in Matthew chapter 11, that, and, he, and he quotes this scripture here referring to John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the messenger of the covenant. When John the Baptist comes on the scene, he's offering them the new covenant, all right? Now watch, let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Now, some of this of what I'm covering with you is a little bit of review from the uh, volume one and volume two, but we do need to cover it. All right. Uh, Matthew chapter three, I want you to notice in verse one. Matthew chapter three, verse one. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, so what we have here is we have scripture that John the Baptist is coming in. He's preaching to the uh, Jews only now. He's not preaching to the uncircumcised Gentiles, okay? And he's offering them the kingdom of heaven, which is the new covenant. That is when the new covenant comes. We discussed this earlier. Now watch. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Notice in verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what we have is we have John the Baptist and we have the Lord Jesus Christ and also the twelve. We don't need to go to that scripture. They're all preaching about the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right? And they're offering the new covenant unto the nation of Israel. All right? Now I want you to go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. All right, in verses uh, 2 through 4, uh, the Lord names off the 12 uh, apostles. Notice in verse 5, it says, These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, I've got a question for you. 
Let's look at this very closely. He tells them, he says, don't go into the way of the Gentiles. He says, don't do it. He says, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Have you got any clue, any idea why he told them not to go to the Gentiles? It is because the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is offering the nation of Israel the new covenant, which is made for Israel. It's not made for uncircumcised Gentiles. Okay? So he told them, don't go to the Gentiles. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now watch. Go to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. In Matthew chapter 15... Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ meets a Gentile woman. Notice in verse 22. It says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Question, who was Jesus Christ sent to? He sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Everybody says, well, Jesus Christ was sent for everybody, but that ain't what the Bible says. It says he was sent only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right, so let's go on to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Now, do you remember that scripture in Isaiah where we talked about where it says, I will place salvation in Zion for Israel? Do you think the Lord Jesus Christ knew that scripture? Well, of course he did. Now watch. Jesus Christ meets another woman. Notice in John chapter 4, verse 19. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So he says here that salvation is of the Jews. Okay? In other words, salvation belonged to Israel. The Lord Jesus Christ knew this. He's offering them the new covenant. The new covenant has to do with the forgiveness of Israel's sins. All right? And he's, he already knew the scripture in Isaiah where it says, I'll place salvation in Zion for Israel. And he tells this woman in John chapter 4, salvation is of the Jews. Okay? Salvation belongs to Israel. Jesus Christ knew this. And he's only offering this unto the nation of Israel at this time. Now watch. Let's go on. Okay? Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he dies and pays for our sins. By the way, he died and paid for everybody's sins, but he came for Israel. Now watch. Let's go on. In fact, I, I'll tell you what. Let's just skip on ahead a little bit. I want to show you a scripture in Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter 9. Um, Romans chapter 9. All right. Romans chapter 9. Notice in verse 1. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. And I, that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So what we have here, we have the Apostle Paul, which is the Apostle of the Gentiles. He also says, concerning the flesh, Christ came for Israel. Okay? Now, uh, so what we have here is plenty of scripture that God was dealing with Israel and offering salvation unto Israel. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now, in Acts chapter 2, the Lord Jesus Christ has already ascended up into heaven. The Holy Spirit comes down. Uh, Peter's filled with the Holy Ghost, and he's preaching unto the Jews. All right? Uh, notice in... Uh, Let's go to chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Uh, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Uh, notice in verse 36. 
Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So what we have here is, is Peter is talking to the Jews, okay? He's preaching that salvation is, is, is for the Jews. And I want you to notice in verse 38. Now this is a very popular verse among a lot of denominational churches. Notice in verse 38. And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So what we have here is we have scripture about Peter saying, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But you know, it's amazing, the people that use this verse, they don't turn the page and go to chapter 3, verse 19, Peter's still talking. He ain't never stopped. Now watch verse uh, 19. Chapter, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. He says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. In other words, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, that is the new covenant. That is when Israel will get the forgiveness of their sins, just like we talked about in volume two, uh, Bible study number three. We talked about the new covenant, what it was, when it was going to be given, and who's it given to. All right, so Peter's preaching. And he tells them that they're going to get forgiveness of sins when the Lord comes back, when the Lord is present on this earth. It's called the uh, times of refreshing. All right. He's going to uh, come down here, and that is when the new covenant starts. Verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God had spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So we have Peter. He's preaching to the Jews. Okay. Why? Because they're offering the new covenant unto the nation of Israel. It is not made for uncircumcised Gentiles. Now watch. Let's go on. Go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Notice in verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. All right. Who's the Lord given repentance to? He's given it to Israel. All right. And forgiveness of sins is on, uh, given unto the nation of Israel. God has not opened the door to the Gentiles at this time. In fact, the door is shut. The Gentiles have to go through the nation of Israel to be saved. They have to take on the covenant of circumcision because if they didn't take on the covenant of circumcision, the Bible says they were dead in their sins and the uncircumcision of their flesh. We'll get to that in just a moment. All right. So what we have here is we have scripture that uh, God's offering the new covenant unto the nation of Israel. Uh, an uncircumcised Gentile cannot be partaker with Israel, cannot be partaker of the new covenant which belongs to Israel. The uncircumcised Gentiles have a problem, okay? The Bible says that they don't have God. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 17, he told Abraham, he says, uh, I will be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. That is the covenant he made. Well, what happens if you don't keep the covenant of circumcision? You won't have a God. All right? Now watch. Let's go back there. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 17. This is very, very important. I need you to understand this. Genesis chapter 17. We're going to cover it again. Because a lot of people... They just kind of overlook the Old Testament scriptures. These things are very, very important. When God says, I'm going to make an everlasting covenant, it's going to be everlasting. It's going to last forever. Now watch. Genesis chapter 17, I want you to notice in uh, verse 7 again. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee. Well, what happens if you broke the covenant? Verse 14, And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. In other words, he cannot be partaker with God's people. Okay? God says, no, it ain't happening. I'm making a covenant with Abraham. It's going to be an everlasting covenant. It's going to last forever. Okay? And you cannot be partaker with Israel if you are an uncircumcised man. Now watch. Let's go on. 
Now, as you know, which we talked about earlier, uh, uh, Jesus Christ stood up in Acts chapter 7 and he judged the nation of Israel in unbelief. Okay? And what happened was God says, okay, salvation, I'm giving it to Israel. They don't want it. I'm going to give salvation unto the Gentiles. And not only am I going to give salvation unto the Gentiles, I'm going to give it to them by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now watch. Let's go on. So what we have here is uh, Jesus Christ stood up in Acts chapter 7 and he gave something called the dispensation of the grace of God given to the Gentiles so that the uncircumcised Gentiles could be saved. Now watch. Um, notice in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, all right, well in Acts chapter 9, he calls out a man named Saul, changes his name to Paul, and made him the apostle of the Gentiles. All right, in uh, Acts chapter, well, it's, I tell you what, it's in, um, all right, well, I'll tell you what, Acts chapter 9, um, the Lord called Ananias and told him to go to Damascus and uh, to see Saul. Now watch, notice in verse 10, Acts chapter 9, verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So what we have here is God has made a decision. He has opened the door unto the Gentiles and... He's already made this decision. He made this decision when Jesus Christ stood up and he judged the nation of Israel in unbelief. Go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, I want you to notice in verse 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 11. It says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So what we have here is we have scripture telling us that Israel had to fall first before salvation could come unto the Gentiles. In other words, uh, Israel had to be cast away. Uh, the Bible talks about them being cast away in Romans chapter 11 here. But God had to make a con have to, had to come to a conclusion. He had to make a judgment on Israel. And when Israel fell, he says, I'm going to give salvation unto the Gentiles. We're in Romans chapter 11. I want you to go to uh, verse 30. Romans chapter 11, verse 30. It says, For as ye in times past have not believed God, now he's talking to the Gentiles, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, talking about Israel. Even so have these also now, now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them in all, all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Well, when did God conclude them in unbelief? He concluded them in unbelief when Jesus Christ stood up in Acts chapter 7 and judged the nation of Israel in unbelief, and that's when God made his decision. Okay? Now watch. And so what happens is he gave something called the dispensation of the grace of God given to the Gentiles where the Gentiles could be saved. Now watch. Now, Peter had no idea what was going on. He didn't have a clue. Now, we've talked about in Acts chapter, uh, uh, one of the Bible studies a while back, we talked about in Acts chapter 10 how Peter went to the Gentiles. All right, well, he didn't go to the Gentiles. He went to Cornelius, who was a Gentile. All right, and we've already talked about Cornelius. I'm not going to go into detail here. But what we have here is we have an uncircumcised man uh, being, being saved. Now, watch, in Acts chapter 10, Peter gets to Cornelius' household. Notice in verse 28, he says, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. 
But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So what we have here is that Peter was shown that he should not call any man common or unclean, and it was showed to him by the, the vision he had in Acts chapter 10. So what we have here is the uncircumcised Gentiles, the door is open to the uncircumcised Gentiles. God had to show Peter what he did so Peter wouldn't be fighting with Paul the whole time. Now watch, go to Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 11, Peter tells the, the, uh, Peter tells the rest of the apostles what happened with him and the uncircumcised Gentiles. He tells them how he told them about Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost fell on them and all this stuff. And watch what happens in verse 18. Acts chapter 11, verse 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So what we have here, and we have in Acts chapter 11, right here in verse 18, the rest of the apostles, uh, the rest of the twelve there, they learned that... Um, the door was opened unto the uncircumcised Gentiles. It says here one time, one more time, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now, in Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and uh, 7, the Lord was not offering salvation unto the uncircumcised Gentiles, but now He is. Now, uh, so what we have here is, the Lord says he's going to build a church, okay? Now, this church that he had in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 is called the New Covenant Church. They were offering the New Covenant unto the nation of Israel. But guess what? An uncircumcised man could not belong to that, all right? We saw a scripture where an uncircumcised man could not belong with, uh, be partakers with Israel. So God had it in his plan before the foundation of the world. He goes, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, create, between a Jew and a Gentile, I'm going to create one new man and uh, make peace, and I'm going to break down that middle wall of partition between them where I can join the Jew and Gentile together. Now watch, let's go to uh, Ephesians chapter 11. Uh, excuse me, Ephesians, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, please. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 11, not chapter 11. All right? Now, notice in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, Paul's talking to the Gentiles, and he's talking about circumcision and uncircumcision. Now, watch here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, notice in verse 11. He says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, do you see that, people? These uncircumcised Gentiles had no hope. All right? God wasn't offering them salvation. All right? These people had no hope and without God in the world. That's what the Bible says. Now, do you remember what it says in Genesis chapter 17? He says, if you keep the covenant, I will be a God unto thee. Remember that? Well, if you didn't keep the covenant, what happened? You didn't have a God. All right? And this is what Paul says. Now watch, verse 11 again. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Now, what's he talking about here? He's talking about circumcision of the flesh and uncircumcision of the flesh. He's talking about a fleshly thing here. Now, watch verse 12. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. In other words, they could not be partakers with Israel. They were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers from the covenants of promise. All right. Now we notice in, in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 17 that they were uh, an uncircumcised man could not be partaker with Israel. They were strangers from the covenants of promise. Okay, with having no hope and without God in the world. Now watch verse 13. Watch the first two words. But now, okay. Notice he says, but now. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, 
and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So what God did, he made something called the one new man, and today is referred to as the church, the body of Christ, okay, the one new man, and this is something that an uncircumcised Gentile can belong to. In fact, God made the one new man so he could save the uncircumcised Gentiles, okay, because the uncircumcised Gentiles could not be partaker of the new covenant church. We found plenty of scriptures that told us they could not be partaker with Israel, but can an uncircumcised man be partaker of this one new man? Yes, he can. That's what God made it for, to save the uncircumcised Gentiles. Now watch. Verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Notice it says by the cross. It doesn't say at the cross. It says by the cross. If it would have said at the cross, then this would have happened at the cross, okay, in Matthew chapter 27. All right, but it didn't. All right? It happened by the cross. The cross made this available. The cross made this possible, okay, of God creating this one new man. And this one new man was made to save the uncircumcised Gentiles, and God is joining both of them together in one body. Let's go on. Uh, verse 17. And came and preached peace to you, which were far off unto them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together uh, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Now watch uh, ch uh, chapter 3, notice in verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now question, who is Paul talking to here? He is talking to the Gentiles. He is not talking to the nation of Israel. He's talking to the Gentiles. Verse 1 again. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now remember all those scriptures we covered before? How they were for Israel? Remember we saw those? For the Jews, for the Jews, for the Jews, for the, for the uh, Israelites, okay, for the Hebrews. Uh, now we have scripture telling us for the Gentiles. Now watch. Verse 2. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to youward. Now, who was this dispensation of grace given to? It was given unto the Apostle Paul to give to the Gentiles. Now, did Paul make the dispensation of grace? No. The Lord made the dispensation of grace. He just gave the message to Paul to deliver the message unto the Gentiles, okay? The Lord gave the dispensation of grace. He told Paul about it so Paul could tell the Gentiles. Now, watch. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Okay? So what we have here is we have Scripture telling us that God has joined together Jew and Gentile in one body. All right? This is something called the one new man. It is something completely different from the New Covenant Church. The New Covenant Church uh, was Jew only, and they had to follow their works, all right, uh, their works were involved, but the one new man, you're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let's go there. Let's back up to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, the one new man, all right, uh, has some different traits to it. All right, now watch. Notice in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So what we have here, this one new man, their salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But not so for the New Covenant Church. Let's go to James chapter 2. Now, if y'all remember, 
And back in volume one, when we did the basics of rightly dividing, I covered the difference between Ephesians 2 and James chapter 2. All right? They didn't say the same thing. Well, now we're going into a little more detail, and I'm showing you which one belongs to what. Okay? Now, Ephesians, he's talking to the one new man. All right? Now, let's go to James chapter 2. In James chapter 2, all right, uh, James is talking to the New Covenant Church, which consists of Jews only. Now watch. James chapter 2, um, notice in verse 14. James chapter 2, verse 14. What doth it profit, uh, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Notice here what James is saying. He's saying, if you got faith, but you don't have any works, your faith is dead. Okay? That's what he's saying. It's very, very important. Now watch. Let's go on. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by work when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works... And by works was faith made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. So what we have here is we have scripture telling us that the new covenant church all right, their works are involved with their salvation. It says here, uh, you see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Okay? So their works are involved. But the one new man, their works are not involved. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let's go to Titus. Now, Paul, he's still referring and still talking to uh, the one new man, the church of the body of Christ. All right? And I want you to go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. In Titus chapter 3, it says here, uh, notice in verse 4, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Verse 5 again, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Now how are the people saved in the one new man? They're saved by God's mercy, okay? Not of works of righteousness. Works are not involved uh, today during the dispensation of grace in the one new man. You're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So what we have here is we have differences in the Bible, okay? Now what we're doing... Uh, in volume one, we started out talking about the basics of rightly dividing. Now, as we go further and further into the scriptures, we're going to get a little deeper and a little deeper and a little more detail into the Word of God. And we're going to show many, many differences between the one new man and the new covenant church. And there are plenty, okay? And we have to discuss these differences, all right? For instance, let's go back to another one. Uh, let's go to James chapter 2. Notice in verse 17. James chapter 2, verse 17. Notice what James says. He's talking uh, to the New Covenant Church. James chapter 2, verse 17. It says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So what we have here is we have Scripture telling us that if you have faith, but you have no works, uh, your faith is dead being alone. Okay? But not so to the one new man. The one new man, a guy can have uh, faith but not have any works and his faith still be counted for righteousness. Let's go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, notice in verse... Uh, I'll tell you what, we'll start in verse 1. It says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? 
For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. But what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Now I'm going to tell you right now, during the dispensation of grace, you work for the Lord, uh, your reward is not reckoned of grace, okay? God's not handing out rewards by grace. He's handing them out by debt. If you work for him, he's going to reward you. That's the way it goes. Now watch, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, who is that? That's somebody that doesn't do any works for the Lord. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay? So what we have here is we have a difference between the one new man and the new covenant church. Okay? The new covenant church, it says there that if they have faith, but they don't have works, okay, their faith is dead. But the one new man, it says here, if you have works, but you don't have, I mean, if you have uh, faith, but you don't have works, your faith is still counted for righteousness, okay? That's a big, big difference. Now, I want you to look up here on the screen, and we're going to put a, a chart up here showing the difference between the New Covenant Church and the One New Man. I want you to notice that the New Covenant Church is split uh, in the middle there with the One New Man, and the One New Man is during the dispensation of the grace of God. The One New Man... Uh, will be raptured out of here before the tribulation period, but the new covenant church will continue through the tribulation period. The new covenant church will be going into the tribulation. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, in Matthew chapter 24, I want you to notice in verse 15, it says, when you shall... Uh, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down and take anything out of his house. So what we have here is, we have scripture telling us the abomination of desolation takes place in the middle of Daniel's 70th week. Okay? And what is going to happen is the people there are going to have to flee to the mountains, okay, when they see the abomination of desolation. All right, well, who's he talking to? He is talking to the New Covenant Church, all right? Now watch, let's go on. The New Covenant Church, as we saw, they will be redeemed or they will be getting their salvation when the Lord comes back. That is the New Covenant. I want you to go to Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21 all right, Luke chapter 21, notice in verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Who is he talking to? He is talking to the New Covenant Church. He's talking to that Jewish church, the New Covenant Church. They will be going through the tribulation, but the one new man is completely different. All right, the one new man will be taken out of here before the tribulation period. All right, God has not appointed the one new man unto wrath. All right, so what we have here is we have differences in the Bible between the one new man and the new covenant church. Now, if you get saved today, you get put into the one new man. I got a question for you. Are you saved? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, believing he died and paid for all your sins at Calvary? Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, I want you to notice in verse 9, the Bible says, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're not saved today, please trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior before it's too late. Ask Jesus Christ to save you, believing he died and paid for all your sins at Calvary. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved.